right, so just a couple of announcements. First of all, thank you all for coming. Um, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Molly Godry. I teach in the BFA and MFA programs. Um, I see a lot of faces that I don't know. So in any case, welcome to our Imagine faculty reading. So again, just a couple of announcements. If you can make sure to sign the sign-in sheet uh, on your way out, if you haven't already done that, we just need a head count of the event. Um, let's see. The application to apply to the BFA program, uh, the deadline is November 1st. So if you're interested in applying for the major, the deadline is November 1st and information is on the website or you can talk to Liz back here. Okay. Um, if you're interested in the creative writing minor, uh, you can just go ahead and declare that on Solar. Just do that online. <laughs> Um, and then finally, last announcement, um, course descriptions for spring 2023 are printed out and available back on the back table, and also they have been emailed to you all. So, yay, spring semester. Yay. All right, so for today, we are here to listen to our poetry faculty. Um, first up, is Christine Catano. Christine is the author of the poetry collections Bird of, Birds of Paradise and Sky Country, which won the Central New York Book Award and was a finalist for the Paterson Poetry Prize. She's co-editor of They Rise Like a Wave, an anthology of Asian American women and non-binary poets. She holds an MFA in creative writing from Syracuse University and a PhD in English and creative writing from Texas Tech. Please welcome Christine. Hello, everyone. This is more formal and official than I expected it to be. There's a microphone. It's good to see you all. Uh, all right, so this is my first time reading at Stony Brook. I'm new faculty here, so it's wonderful to meet you all. I teach poetry, uh, so come take a poetry class with me. <laughs> I teach other stuff too, but uh, my, my number one genre is poetry. Uh, let's see, so I'm going to read a few poems from my second book, Sky Country, and then I'm going to read a couple of new poems. Um, one, two, three, four. I'm going to read a total of six poems, and I like to tell people that because I always like to know what people are up to when they're reading. Um, all right, so I'll talk to you just a little bit about these poems uh, so you know maybe what to listen for. Um, the first poem I'll read from my collection is called Choose Your Own Adventure, Go South. Do you all remember Choose Your Own Adventure books? Uh, so this is a poem that is modeled on that format. So it's in second person, uh, just thinking about directing the speaker. So Choose Your Own Adventure, Go South. Under a rusted water fountain at a rest stop in Pennsylvania, you find a small jar filled with a woven cocoon, or perhaps the mummified remains of a rat. Birth or death, you take it, secure it in the cup holder, then drive the day, the glass rattling, no trembling within its plastic restraints. At sunset, a translucent honey gold fills the car, and the trees in what is now Virginia lean in close. The elms are large as clouds. In the motel that night, unclothed, you slip into the indoor pool. It is heated and lit from below like a cauldron. You don't know how to swim, so you float. The glowing water buoys you up. In that sulfurous light, with your arms spread like wings, you might be an airplane's X-shaped shadow or a child's summertime toy. But soon, your body collapses like a broken ruler, and water fills your nose, the tile walls suddenly snug. Always the way we notice change, the space around us almost the same, then not. Same, same, but different, like the moment the elevator door finally slides shut. You wake the next morning in the motel bed, hair still wet. Your neck aches. Someone had curled you up like a small animal. Someone had placed the jar on the nightstand beside you, its contents now vanished or simply emptied. From your head, a chlorinated map seeps onto the sheets. 
Confess that you're sorry. Confess that you're not. The transparent jar glimmers in the dusty half-light. You continue south. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, I'm realizing that my next poem is also, no, this is not second person. This is a third person poem. Um, so I wrote a lot of these poems uh, after I had moved to Texas. I lived in Syracuse for a few years, then moved to Texas. Uh, and when I got to Texas, I started going to the gym. Uh, and that was a new thing for me to do. Uh, and I have this character that I've been working with. And so she's just a version of myself, and her name is Insomniac, uh, for reasons that are not that creative. Uh, so this is just called Insomniac Starts an Exercise Routine. The first week passes, then two. Soon, it has already been six months. A mile's distance feels less slog, more flight. Her body in flux, when she reaches behind to scratch a shoulder blade, she feels a thickness, a heft where before had been just bone. New swellings rise, not tumors as first feared, but muscles, the names of which she has to look up in a textbook. Latissimus dorsi, biceps brachii, vastus lateralis, the words long and Latin like the names of stars. Others comment on the angles now articulated in her face. But it isn't, as they say, the shedding of an old layer. And it isn't, as has been said, the angel emerging from its stone. The end product will be a complete transformation, total and final. Beneath her skin, a new form pieces itself together. The bruises that speckle her limbs bud from within. One day, as if waking from a dream, she'll find a new face in place of the old perhaps with gills etched behind her ears, maybe fins in place of feet, or instead of arms, wings. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, all right, I will read. Uh, so one more poem from my collection. Uh, and this is a more personal poem, it's a first person poem. And it's called Chicken Soup, and it's about my grandmother. Chicken Soup. My grandmother pours salt into my right palm, places thin slivers of garlic in my left. She explains something about blood, how to salt the raw bird to drain its fluids, but my mind already wanders. I watch the chicken shrivel, but compose instead the grandfather I've only met in story. Daybreak, he's just finished mopping up in the buildings that sculpt this city's skyline, but it's someone else's view of Los Angeles. The immigrant sees not the postcard perfect lights, but the scuffed tiles, dust-lined desks, the darkening throats of toilet after toilet. Home, he tiptoes upstairs not to wake his daughters, holding his shoes like a thief. He's fired for stealing a roll of toilet paper, a can of soda for my mother. Children are nothing but trouble, my grandmother says, shaking a wooden spoon. My mother claims the story otherwise. It was she who accompanied father to work, she who stole a box of stale donuts, she who lost the family's first job. Grandmother shrugs and repeats the same conclusion, Never have children, she says, though her expression is hidden by the steam now rising from the pot. It's a simple recipe. Boil until the meat falls from the bones, easy like a girl shedding a summer dress. Last night, I cooked for friends. After dinner, my friend handed me his one-month son, who only blinked when I nudged my thumb into his fist. Earlier, washing the pale bird, I struggled to keep the body from slipping through my hands. I held its small fleshed form under cold water, pulled the giblets out the round hollow between its ribs, and was surprised to be surprised when it didn't make a sound. I will read, I said, Four, six. I'll read one more poem from, from here and then I'll go to my newer drafts. 
Um, this is a shorter poem. I grew up in California. I grew up in Los Angeles, Southern California. Uh, I saw on the news this morning that they just had an earthquake in Northern California. Uh, and the idea of earthquakes was, was always present when I was growing up. So this is a poem called Earthquake Drills. Have a plan. Under your bed, hard-soled shoes, a flashlight, water bottles, canned corn niblets, peaches, and sweet syrup. San Andreas, a mean line on a map. How long until your earth unzips itself? How long for the fault to burst its crooked seam? For small comfort, count bandages, replace batteries, pack a bag, but admit this, there is never a plan. Instead, in deep night, darkness thick on the lawn, find your flashlight. With your thumb, click the switch. Watch the sure light flicker on. Um, so those are just some of the poems in this book. There are a lot of other poems in here, but uh, I don't know. I've, some of the other poems I've read a lot, so I wanted to read some of the poems that I don't read that often. All right, so I'm going to read two more poems, and these are newer poems that are not yet published in a collection. Uh, and these I chose because they come out of uh, teaching first-year students in particular. So I was teaching at Ithaca College before I got here, and I was assigned the first-year seminar, and I was teaching a lot of 18-year-old um, students, first years, and they were always asking me what I remember, remembered about college. And it was thinking through that uh, that I remembered these moments. So I'll start with a poem that's a little bit longer. Uh, and this takes place in September 2018, and I'm giving just some context. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh was uh, nominated for, for the Supreme Court, and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford was testifying about what had happened to her when she was, was in high school with him. Uh, and that's one of the contexts that sets this poem. It's called Dumb Luck. Such luck, I think, driving to work, wheels skidding to a hard stop when the chipmunk darts in front of my car, pauses, then scurries back into the browning shrubs. Motionless in that moment, the possibility of one outcome gives way to another. Then breath, then the voices on the radio, then they're saying my name, no, the name of Dr. Christine Blase Ford, who has entered the Senate chamber, taken a seat. I look around at the empty street, press the pedal. In exaggerated whispers, the reporters blithely describe her, surprised she's not a surfer girl, as a woman under a lot of pressure. I'm late for work, unusual for me, but earlier this morning had heard from a friend about another friend that her husband has left her just months after their marriage and announced pregnancy. What terrible luck, I said, then wanted to take back, not sure if luck was the right word. This news and the news on the radio skirt each other in my mind, strike sparks when they get close. Then this, in college, I waitressed at a Korean-owned sushi restaurant in an unassuming strip mall where I would arrive straight from class, apply lipstick and eyeliner using a simmering pot of miso soup as a mirror next to the chef's knife and clean the fish, sloughed scales sharp and translucent like chips of glass. It was luck that had gotten me the job, or so I believed, over 18 and authentically Japanese, half anyway, and enough comprehension of Korean, the other half, to get by in the kitchen. Korean enough to not question tossing salt on the front stoop to chase away bad luck, like that night a man walked into the restaurant, lifted his hoodie just enough to reveal the triangle butt of a gun tucked into the waistband of his jeans, then walked out with our fishbowl of dollar tips. My boss's mother, the cook, ran from the kitchen, hurling fistfuls of salt, cursing the gods, her son, and me. I admit I was distracted by the greasy swastika inked across the man's throat, can still see the wounds wet. Then, not so much bad luck, but still rude, one time an ajuma from my boss's gag group an Ajima is a middle-aged woman, uh, tossed a crumpled napkin at me, which hit my chest before landing on a tray I was carrying. 
And many customers would, at some point, as we ferried platters of raw fish to their tables, ask us where we were from, where we learned to speak English. Once a table of white men asks to make me a deal. They'll bring me a pie if I say, me love you long time. They're older than me, but not by much. They wear trucker-style caps backwards, the mesh pressing into their pale, fleshy foreheads. I remember then the sound of their laughter, then their faces reddening, then the odor of sweat and hormones and stale beer, and the words spilling at my mouth before I had full comprehension. What kind of pie? It was a joke, I thought, or think I thought, but their howls sent a phantom finger down my spine. After my shift, my boss handed me a wad of cash, said the group had tipped big to buy myself a hamburger on the drive home. I counted the bills in my car under a street lamp in the parking lot, all those soy sauce stained $1 bills. I think of myself then, 19 years old, alone in a dark parking lot, money fanned across my lap. Nothing but unearned luck has kept me safe and alive these 33 years, a dumb gift luck whose mouth I pry open every morning for inspection. But not this morning. Through the radio speakers, I hear a woman shivering. I think of my friend, newly pregnant, also on her way to work, how she'll twist a ring off her swollen finger. I think of the tattooed man's eyes, what I thought was desperation, but maybe was not, was maybe hate or power or fear or even hunger, how I couldn't hold his gaze, my eyes unable to resist the twisted omen he'd chosen to stab into his flesh. When I was 19, alone in that dark parking lot, dollar bills spread on my lap, thinking of all things about a hamburger, I failed to notice the white pickup truck that will pull out after me, follow me down each side street, the red laughter of the men in my rearview mirror. And for a breathless moment, I recognize how this scene is narrowing to that one outcome, how it feels inevitable, like the easing on of a mask for a role I had been destined to play. But no, but what luck. I lost them, made it to the anonymity of the freeway where I maneuvered through five lanes of easy traffic, the chorus of identical brake lights, a radiant red shield. Despite the betrayal of my own mouth, through no good choices of my own, I survived. But is there no other word for it than luck, or as my mother would let later say, book, fortune, in her eyes, something you're either born with or not. Such luck to get home safe when so many do not. Is there really no other word? Thank you. And the last poem I'll read, uh, this one definitely takes place when I was a first year in college. So it's me remembering that. And it's called The Body of the Possum. I went to college in Southern California. Uh, and there were a lot of possums around. Body of the Possum. It was spring, late semester, the riverside air thick with jasmine, eucalyptus, a ripe, fragrant heat you could almost see. Nineteen, and though I didn't know it then, still in a winter of mourning, though who doesn't grieve at nineteen after enough of childhood's petty injuries, already a lifetime's worth of disappointments. And I couldn't name it then, but it was a breed of this grief that wrenched me awake each night, my body a breathless, pure pulse. And so it was near 20 years ago, I answered the midnight phone call from a boyfriend who was sobbing. I killed a possum, he said. Will you come see? Already awake, I agreed. In the car, I asked what had happened. He said he had run over a possum on the way back from McDonald's on a side road off Canyon Crest. He wanted to drive by, by again for me to check if it were really dead, still dead. I remember the night as pitch black, driving through darkness on all sides, the street flanked by the Box Springs Mountains, the thickening trees blocking any light from the moon. It was somewhere here, he said, slowing the car to a stop. Can you look, please? 
I didn't know what I was looking for, but I stuck my head out the window he had already rode, rolled down on my side. Up, I, up ahead, I saw what might be a flash of white and said so. That's it, he said, and inched us closer. I unbuckled my seatbelt, tucked my bare feet under my knees, the better to lean out, and when I did, it was as if, like a curtain on cue, the trees parted and the moon swiveled its spotlight to illuminate the possum's smashed face, half gravel, half flesh, one shoe-button eye trained on me, its triangle mouth agape as if mid-scream. I screamed too, and my boyfriend wailed, a pitiful, heartbroken sound that surged, not empathy, but rage, like a fever through my hundred-pound body, the glowing animal's broken face, just one more in the line of petty disappointments, the face I would have further broken, smashed, and flung back at the surrounding indifferent houses. Instead, I balled a burger wrapper in my fist and tossed it out the window, said only, let's go. The boy was crying, and I hated him then, his innocence, his weakness, the otherwise ease with which I imagined he would navigate the rest of his simple life, unable to face the most minor mistakes. And me, I carry that possum with me, like the body of the girl I was, the girl I was leaving behind, that moonlit face I can still see when I close my eyes. All right. Thank you all. Okay, we're standing room only. <laughs> Um, just a little reminder that after, um, after the two readings, uh, there's a Q&A, so you can start formulating some questions that you might have for the two poets, okay? Uh, our next poet is Julie Sheehan. Julie is a recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and the author of three collections, Bar Book, Poems and Otherwise, Orient Point, which won the Barnard Women Poets Prize, and Thaw, winner of the Poets Out Loud Prize from Fordham University. Other honors include the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Poetry, and the Elizabeth Matchett Stover Award, the Robert H. Winter Prize from Poetry Society of America, and from the Paris Review, the Bernard F. Connors Prize. Please welcome Julie. <laughs> Hey, everyone. So I'm so excited to have Christine here with us. And we've already got Molly. We are a poetry force to be reckoned with. And uh, you know, we could take over the whole world <laughs> if they would let us. Um, all right, I'm going to start with a poem that's uh, that actually you, your experience as a 19-year-old, I think I was probably at uh, 22, it was my first job when I had the experience alluded to in this poem. It's a sonnet, and so it turns at line nine over to what happened to me, but in metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Parasites. Some suck blood, some strangle you like vines, and some you internalize. You'd hardly know your father was a tick or the tennis pro a tapeworm. Some have papers to align your interests with theirs. Some officiate in scrubs, the cheap light green of clinic beds at arranged marriages. You'll feel some pressure, a slight weight. Mine was a liver fluke. I blame watercress without a spermicide. I was his host, though I thought he was mine. He paid the check. I paid the price. So young, so dumb, depressed less than I should have been. Forgiving most where bile my Flaring temper, least infects. Uh, this is a poem with lots of, uh, it's called Capitalism. Very tiny little lines. 
tiny little lines and lots of internal rhymes and uh, it has an epigraph from Emily Dickinson who tells us, reduce no human spirit to disgrace of price. And it came from noticing the verbs that Wall Street uses about itself. They're like, they talk about themselves totally in sexual terms. So here we go. <laughs> Capitalism. There is no hand. There's head instead. The Dow bumps, rocks, or plunges, surges in confidence, benefit verbs. Red ink hits a monthly high. Battered tech stocks die. How Wall Street hammers, hands free. Equity leaves no mark on auction blocks. Come on, Ma, I barely touched her. You liar. <laughs> you hooker. Now I have another poem called Capitalism Remix, same kind of vibe. <laughs> Here we go. Capitalism Remix. Salt and wool socks in a fable Neruda boxed. A modest commodification. But Nike stocks socked from rayon snap options up on Goldilocks, who trusted her bank to sell her short skirts and block regulation. Why not play slots, sluts, suckers, and marks? Liquidity spurts like semen. A squawk box no racket makes as Goldilocks gets taken. Um, so these are all from a new collection um, of poems. Uh, and this one's the right now arranged as the last poem of the whole collection. We'll see if it stays there. And it's called In the Early Days of the World Wide Web. <laughs> I was there, you guys. I was there in those early days. And the title just goes right into the poem. So it's also kind of the first line of the poem. In the early days of the World Wide Web, disembodied souls talked of disembodied souls. Theology.com and Poems.com hadn't been claimed as domain names. Dominion over a word. Domain stuck a, struck us as a stage name. Like a globe we thought we'd hyperlink with cobwebs, why not? But nothing clicked, no one clicked dead links, we learn to call them later on. Some flies struggled to escape. I never tore a thread. And yet, connections dropped. I swear I missed your email. Please excuse my late reply. <laughs> the system crashed. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple of poems in this book um, that take on um, the kind of uh, environmental catastrophes that uh, you all especially get to deal with. Because while I was there in the early days of the World Wide Web, I won't be there in the late days of <laughs> climate catastrophe. All right, this poem's called 1,000 Cassandras. And as we know, Cassandra is the figure um, who is, she's one of the Trojans in the um, great epic by Homer, um, or a Homeric tribe of people with an oral poetry tradition, but we won't go there. Um, she's the figure who is destined always to speak the truth, but never to be listened to. So no one ever believes her, even though She's always right. And boy, can we relate. <laughs> so that's why there's 1,000 of them. 1,000 Cassandras. 
The chorus has arrived for the epilogue. We didn't know our leaders lied. They idled like a Cadillac convertible adjustable preferred stock while not one incandescent bulb blinked on. Cassandra of the Atoll drowns in salt. Cassandra of Kansas drowns in a fine dust. Cassandra of Antarctica goes missing when her ice block calves catastrophically. The chorus sings, we couldn't, didn't know, tra-la-la, let's have a side of beef. But you, dear reader, by dint of reading poems, suffer enough. Your square shooting ear like riding shotgun in an open car. You smell the feral pigs come down from Hopog to eat the corn. The licorice wind closing in, humming Timor Mortis Conturbat May. Who will avenge peninsulas? We've shaved their margins. Rage flares up. It's natural to derricks with their echiponderant stink. Cassandra of the Midlands drowns in ink. I'll read two more poems. Uh, this one also a sonnet from my dad. He passed away in December. It's called Living Will. Pneumonia, pneumonia shoulders, scooping for air or splayed, erode the profile. You could barely walk, then dress, then sit. It goes that way. They call it progress, the spread of dark clouds across your chest x-ray as the work of breathing clogs up any joy from aspiration. You woke, I slept late. Next would come machines, but automate the labor and the bodies unemployed. You love the human touch, and so I cupped your hand in mine. The little breath you had clouded the mask. I read your lips. You said, no ventilator. What filled that plastic cup, if not a spirit giving a body reprieve? A living will is not the will to live. Aw, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and the last poem I'll read is called Extinction Song, but it's cheerful, Tr trust me, it's cheerful. <laughs> um, and it's about the Minoans, who were this awesome group of people that we know nothing about, right? They have a language, Linear A, we call it. It was syllabic and kind of a precursor to our, you know, the Romance languages. Um, we can't read it. Uh, they're, they, they're the ones who had the Minotaur. Um, and they, they left behind some art where the women were usually, their skin was painted white and the men's skin was painted red. Um, do we know why? We do not. So that's kind of the spirit of this song. Extinction song. Remix. <laughs> Minoans, Minoans, I'm wild about Minoans. From linear A to their bright squat columns, all ruined. But why? It's inscriptions that no one's read for ages might very well exhort those Cretans to exclaim, what bliss, like us subsisting on wine, oil, and gold, oil, gold, and administrative tablets galore, so organized, accounting for we know not, most glorious rattles 
and wild bulls and a love of our kenosis coded, but we will never, never decipher. Shout Hoshana as the harvester vase singers do, except in unknown syllables and to mother gods. Paint women white as mimes or men red as the minotaur, for we cannot grow old on a long gone hilltop with quite the garbled wit of Minoans. Minoans, I'm wild for Minoans. <laughs> Okay, so at this point, we can open it up to audience questions, if you have any. And I'll wait, I'll wait you out, I'll wait. <laughs> yes. My current obsessions are, are religious fanaticism. The manuscript right now opens with a long poem called Angry Christians. Um, that's about um, in Egypt, you know, these ancient ruins, beautiful, um, were defaced by early Christians who kind of were trying to kill the old gods, right? And Egyptian vernacular, you know, the sort of locals still kind of were like, yeah, there's Jesus, but you know, there's also Toth, and we're gonna hedge our bets and kind of go with both. You know, so the, the Christians were, you know, and I see a lot of shades of that today. Um, so that's one obsession that kind of is strung through the manuscript. And of course, the environmental devastation that, um, that we're facing, or not facing, actually. Um, those are probably the two main themes that I hope people, I hope I'm contributing to that conversation. Are the poems unintelligible? Were they hard to understand? <laughs> I feel like they were like early teenagers, and I think they might be a divided poem. Like, like the one that teenagers were, but I think it's hard to like dissect people's depictions of the world. Like, I don't have one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, humor can also be a mask for rage which in my case is often what's actually going on. I'm really pissed off. The bigger I smile, the unhappier I am. Yeah. So asking, basically, do the images in the poems, do they come from like the real experience or do I, do I go back and try to find images for the experience? Yeah. And I would say both. Um, there are some poems that come from an image. Uh, and so I think we all have that experience where you're walking around and you see something or you hear something or you taste something that stays in your head and that becomes the impetus for the poem. Uh, I think more for me it's the second where it's, I have a particular story that I wanna tell or some idea that I wanna explore. And then with that, I, it makes me awake to the world and I'm looking for images to get into that thing. And so for me, the images actually come when I'm looking for images to help tell the story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hi, I have a question to Dr. Trump. Um, so I, I know based on kind of the context that you gave about your poem, your, uh, your poet and poet speaker is very close to you mm -hmm. as the author. So how do you make those decisions about kind of the distance between speaker and, and uh, poet? Excellent. 
excellent question. Yeah, uh, the poems that I've read, definitely the speaker is more autobiographical. I also have a lot of poems where I experimented with writing about someone or writing through the voice of someone who was definitely not me. Uh, and I did that to practice with distance. I wanted to really try to push myself outside of my own personal experience. Um, as an exercise that was good, the lesson was that you're always writing about yourself <laughs> in some way. Uh, and so, but it was good practice so that when I did go back to writing more, more autobiographically, I think I was able to at least practice pushing myself out a little bit more to bring in a little bit more objectivity. Uh, but it is a constant thing that I'm thinking about, is how am I writing beyond just the personal? How, even if I'm writing autobiographically, how can I push myself to, to write beyond just myself? And I'm still practicing with that. <laughs> shifted at different parts of my life depending on you know what like uh, I'm very fortunate now my child is grown and capable of dressing himself and you know <laughs> stuff like well sort of <laughs> you know he likes what he wears um so you know so so I have a lot more um freedom to to write when I feel like it um weekends are great um, but uh, early on when I didn't have that luxury and my financial situation was a lot more precarious, you know, I wrote in these little windows of time when I had childcare and I knew when they were coming and so I just would sit down and write and also I got up really, really early. I finished my second book by getting up at four in the morning and writing till six. What about you? Um, <laughs> I'm also, I'll start there. I'm also generally an early morning person. Uh, I, I like structure, I like rules, I like routines. Uh, so for the past few years, I've been getting up early. I haven't done it in the past like month, so I take that. But, uh, in general, I like to get up early and work for 25 minutes. I like 25 minutes because like, it's a little bit more than 20 minutes, but it's not half an hour, which feels <laughs> just impossible. Uh, and so I've been doing that, and so I'm now at the point where I have like hundreds of pages of these little things I've written in 25 minutes. And what I need to do is start going back and shaping them into poems, and I've done that. It's a really slow process. I'm a slow writer, I just wanna put that out there. I'm a very slow writer, a very slow reviser, a very slow reader, I'm a very slow many, many things. Um, but I'm lucky enough to have time that it's okay that I don't have pressures to publish um, right away <laughs> at least. So I, I'm, I'm lucky to take that time, but I'm slowly shaping my way towards a third manuscript. So we're a couple, yeah. You mean like pen? Um, pen? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, I do both. I, I like writing by hand, at least to start with, but then when I'm really tinkering with the poem, I like typing it out because it helps me think about what it will look like for most people, and it's easier to maneuver stuff like in Microsoft. I can only write this pen. <laughs> it has to be a Uniball Onyx fine tip. I have learned this over the years. It's the only pen for me on a just cheap notepad. <laughs> I used to use legal pads, mm. but they're like the 30 minutes of 25 minutes. They're like just a little too long. <laughs> I like to say, oh, I finished that page. I like writing on yellow paper now that you said that. Uh -huh. Like yellow legal pads, the yellow is kind of fun because it's mm -hmm. like, it feels different from all the other work that you do in your life. Do you keep your note? Do you keep these yeah. pads? Me too. What are you going to do with these? I just <laughs> moved the whole box of these pads. <laughs> the idea is that there's a, there's, there's a poem in there, so I'm going to go find one. <laughs> How many of you keep 
notes on your phones. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Like, that's a good habit. It's like keeping a, you know, notebook. Just like you see something or you smell something or taste something and make a little note in your app, notes app. And that's your legal pad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go. How do you work with the material of doing past stuff? I can't make everything else on my phone, and then it's just lost to the universe. So, what do you Well, I would print them out and then take a scissors and cut. Like, there comes a point where my, I commandeer the floor in order to figure out, like, I have this pile over here and that pile over there. Um, what's going on? It's a practice just like, I mean, the first practice is to start taking those notes. The second practice is to come back to them and turn them into poems. Yeah, I, I've, I'm working on the second practice right now. Uh, my method so far has been to get another notebook <laughs> and start reading through the other notebooks and writing down the stuff that I actually like from the old ones. So I'm there. I'll let you know what happens after this time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question and then for books. both of you. Um, when you guys um, are writing like in general or just poems, do you like take notes as you get ideas or do you just like sit down and write whatever's on your head and then get back to it later and like formulate your ideas at home? I go I, I go back and forth. If I'm lucky, I get the whole poem. I get a draft of a poem. But if all I can do is notes towards something I think eventually is going to be a poem, then that's what I do. I'm in the whatever works school of process, I guess. What about you? Um, I think I, I very rarely just sat down and said, I'm going to write a poem and written a poem. I don't, I don't know if I've ever done that. Uh, it's always just trying to play around with language and get in touch with language and very slowly it forms its way into a poem. Yeah, what were you going to ask? When you're editing, that kind of segues into editing, mm -hmm. but do you ask people to read your poems? Do you have people that you turn to to say, do you like this, do you get it, whatever? It's so hard, even <laughs> at my age. I gave Molly something I was working on. It was like, <laughs> you know? So, and if you send work out to magazines, you'll hear back from them whether they like your poems or not. <laughs> That's that too. How about you? Do you have readers that you... Uh, I'm lucky my partner is a poet, and so every now and then I'll, I'll but even then I, I'm very hesitant because I'm like, I already know what you're going to say, and I already disagree with what you're going to say, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it's, it is really helpful to have just a, a second pair of eyes, um, but for the most part, I'm, I self-edit, which is probably why it takes me so long, because it takes, I would say, six months to get new eyes. And so you write something, you edit it for a little bit, and then about six months later, I can go back and I can see it and really more objectively edit. Yeah. Uh, yes, and then we'll, we'll go to you. Yeah. Um, two things. I have, like, through the editing process, it's one of the great things about the workshop class that we have is we'll be making Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just talking about this yesterday um, where I said I don't I was not a born teacher like I think there's some people who have a personality and I was so shy I was like the most the most painfully shy person up until grad school even I remember being an MFA student and I was in class and I 
would say something in class and I would see like my whole face went red. Mm -hmm. Like I just, just so painfully shy. And so I didn't think that I was going to be a teacher. I loved school and all that process of it, but standing up and talking in front of people felt like an impossible thing to me. And then at some point, I saw, te I understood that teachers don't necessarily have to have a particular personality and that opened it up to me. And I felt like, oh, this is something that I can be good at, not in the way that I imagined you were supposed to be good at it, but I could find a way to communicate and connect with people in the classroom in my own way. And once that became clear to me, I really fell in love with teaching um, as its own pursuit, as a, as a way to contribute to the world in a way that poetry, yes, it does hopefully, but I really wanted to take the thing that I love to do, which is poetry, and be able to share with other people how I, how I learned how to do it and to hopefully help other people find their own way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> To, to read your work out loud, you mean? Oh. Well, time's a friend <laughs> there as well. Yeah. Again, I mean, maybe you don't want to wait six months. <laughs> That's a luxury of time. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, even even if you let it rest like like bread dough, mm -hmm. like overnight. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's enough time to read it without weeping at, you know, I imagined this and I got this, <laughs> you know, that's the problem, right? So then, you know, you'll have renewed energy to say, how can I get this more like that for this draft? ready for more pizza, are we? <laughs> Is that what we're ready for? Yeah, thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs>